after his party won a big majority in the UK general election. He repeated his promise that Britain will leave the EU by the end of next month. The main opposition Labour Party suffered a serious setback in the election, losing nearly 60 seats. Its leader, Jeremy Corbyn, says he won't fight another election, but he's not stepping down immediately. The House Judiciary Committee in Washington has approved two articles of impeachment against President Trump. It's the final stage before a vote in the House on impeachment itself, which is expected next week. And American stocks have been given a boost after the U.S. and China struck a preliminary trade agreement, easing tensions between the world's two biggest economies who've been engaged in an acrimonious trade war. Those are the headlines. Now on BBC News, the Black Sea is Europe's most polluted. But as Jonah Fisher finds out, thanks to a major international cleanup effort, there are now signs that the sea is starting to recover. The Black Sea is beautiful. It's a fantastic place. There are thousands of uh, living species in it. Uh, some of them are very unique. In Europe's southeastern corner, there is a sea that for decades served as the region's dustbin. This is now a real problem. Uh, people are dying for that. Fertilizers, industrial chemicals, raw sewage have flowed unchecked into the Black Sea, past tourist beaches, ruining fishing grounds. Would kill entire the Black Sea. Like uh, people would not be swimming in it, fish would not be living in it. Black Sea Channel. Black Sea Channel. It's more, it's more like rotten eggs. But having hit rock bottom, is Europe's most polluted sea finally cleaning up its act? Do you think the Black Sea is now on its way back? Нет, уже не ревет. Он стонет. To understand the Black Sea's problems, look inland. Вы видите, Днепр умирает. To the rivers that fill it, reaching thousands of kilometers across Eastern Europe. Вон, посмотрите, Днепр цветет. Смотрите, смотрите, что происходит. Alexander Chistyakov has been monitoring the Dnipro in Ukraine for years. Это только полулето. Представьте, что будет в августе. Вот результат попадания фосфатов в воду. Вот она. He's showing us what's known as blooming. It's when too many nutrients get in the water, triggering a rapid, lurid green growth of algae. Вот, если зайти голой ногой в гущу отмирающих водорослей можно получить легкие ожоги. Вот эти вот водоросли интенсивно разливаются из-за того, что в Днепр попадают фосфаты с моющих средств. Это со всех моек киевских, с наших стиральных машин. Outside the cities, the runoff from fertilizers used in farming is also a big part of the problem. Вот ливневая канализация. As is untreated waste. Of course, if fertilizers and waste is dumped in the rivers, it means pollution when those rivers then flow into the Black Sea. Three rivers provide the bulk of the Black Sea's pollution. The Dnipro, the Dniester, and the longest of them all, the Danube. Back in June, the water quality made the headlines in Ukraine. A combination of heavy rain followed by hot weather turned the water near Odessa into a nutrient-rich pea soup. And anything that swam in it turned green. В августе, но оно произошло из-за теплой погоды, очень жаркой, произошло в июне. Вода не соответствовала нормативам практически на каждом пляже. 
Elena and Angela work for Odessa's sanitation department and test the Black Sea every Monday. This year they advised holidaymakers not to swim through most of the peak month of August. Not that it put many people off. You're not worried the water's not clean? No. Почему? <laughs> and when the authorities say the water is dirty, don't swim, do you stop? <laughs> Are you not worried that this water is polluted and it might make you sick? A thousand kilometers away, on another very different beach, one of the Black Sea's most visible problems is piling up. This is Batumi in Georgia, a holiday boomtown on the sea's far eastern edge. It's grown exponentially in the last 10 years. But Batumi has a dirty, smelly secret, just a kilometer from its tourist beaches. So this is the main rubbish dump here in Batumi. Obviously, it's pretty disgusting. You can see full of animals scavenging off, off the rubbish, people too. But the big issue for here is that, well, it's only about 300, 400 meters from this rubbish dump to the Black Sea itself. And there's a waterway which basically leads all the way down there. Taking the rubbish with it. Having scrambled down onto the beach, we find some locals. It's called a fish. Are you going to eat them? Are you not worried that there's a rubbish dump just up the road and that this water might have come from there? A few meters away on the beach, rubbish from the dump is being washed up. So there's rubbish all along this beach, but just to give you a little sense of part of it, what it's made up of, well, there's lots of plastic bottles everywhere. Yeah, that, that's part of a, a light bulb, an inhaler, some sort of plastic brush, more medicine bottles, that looks like. And over here, lots and lots more plastic bottles, some sort of margarine container, a shoe. Really depressing and grim to see it like this, because this is just a little snapshot here, but it goes all the way on in a pretty similar way to this. Poor waste management and rubbish dumped along rivers have turned the Black Sea into Europe's most polluted. The latest survey shows a concentration of litter in the sea almost twice as high as in the Mediterranean. For years, there was very little detailed information about the state of the Black Sea. Cop copper pots. Copper pots yeah. That's now copper changing. Pots and we've joined the Mare Negrum, a research vessel funded by the European Union. Packed full of scientists, its job is to travel right across the Black Sea, providing the data to better inform government decisions. Long before humans began ruining the Black Sea, it had, thanks to its geography, a unique makeup. The 89% of the total volume of the Black Sea, it's not this beautiful blue water with jumping dolphins here and there, that it's hydrogen sulfide. 
toxic, smelly chemical. So when we go down 100, 150 meters under the surface, forget the life, you know, bacteria is there. What's worrying scientists is that climate change might lead to a shift in the delicate balance between the two layers. One of the many unknowns about the Black Sea is how climate change and rising sea temperatures will affect the oxygenated layer at the top and the hydrogen sulphide below that. Now this device here, well, these tanks will take samples of water at different depths and the sensors beneath here, they're designed to measure the temperature, the salinity uh, and the oxygen content of the water. That allows the scientists to say at what point in the water the oxygenated layer ends and the hydrogen sulphide layer, that dead zone, begins. As the device is lowered, it sends back its readings. Uh, oxygen minimum on this uh, location uh, about uh, 88 uh, meters. So the hydrogen sulphide layer starts at 88 meters here? Uh, about 90 meters, yeah. What would be the impact for the Black Sea if the hydrogen sulphide layer rose up? It would kill entire the Black Sea, like uh, people would not be swimming in it, fish would not be living in it, no, but no plant would be growing on, at the bottom of the sea. At the moment, the data suggests that the oxygenated layer that supports life is getting squeezed. But there's not enough evidence yet to make firm conclusions. So the water from the different depths is now being removed and taken away. It will be analysed and looked at very closely for traces of plastics, pollutants, organic matter, all helping the scientists here to get a better idea of how healthy or unhealthy that part of the Black Sea is. The same painstaking process is repeated at 12 different sampling sites over the course of seven days. But to get an idea of what's going on on the seabed, you need a different piece of kit. We're now at one of the deepest parts of the Black Sea, and if you want to find out what's on the bottom here, you need to use a tool like this. This is called a multi-corer. The way it works is it's sent down over the side and then it will hit the bottom and sediment from the bottom will be gathered up in those plastic tubes there and brought back up to the surface. The middle of the Black Sea is more than two kilometers deep, so it takes more than half an hour for it to reach the ocean floor. Now you don't. No, okay, it's, it's down. Okay, down. so now it's now hit the bottom. So the reading's about 2,200. The muddy sludge gathered, it's winched back up to the boat. So this sample has come right from the very bottom of the Black Sea, the part where there's no oxygen, the hydrogen sulfide layer. Oh, the smell. Yes, no smell. Smell is, is Chanel. You think it's Chanel? Black Sea Chanel. Black Sea Chanel. It's more, it's more like rotten eggs. Samples taken from the bottom at sites hundreds of kilometres from the shore have shown the extent of the Black Sea's contamination. When we plastic in expeditions, we Microplastics are tiny pieces of plastic which can be swallowed by marine creatures and thus get into the food chain. The study of microplastics is relatively new, so it's not clear yet what impact ingesting them will have on our health. To get good samples of the surface seawater, I leave the main research vessel with Peter Oswald, a Slovakian scientist.
Peter tells me he's been finding tiny traces of everyday items in the middle of the sea. It's a group of stimulants like caffeine, illicit drugs, painkiller stuff like ibuprofen and diclofenac. And then there are compounds coming from personal care products, from shampoo and um, water, uh, this dishwasher detergents and so on. That, that sounds horrifying. Well, should we be worried about this? The biggest threat is coming from pharmaceuticals, especially from antibiotics. The problem is that bacteria, which are also here, can get resistant against these antibiotics. And this is the biggest problem. And that's because if there's antibiotics in the Black Sea, that means the bacteria is going to develop here that will resist the antibiotics yeah, yeah. and mean that ultimately that medicine doesn't work anymore. Yeah, this is now a real problem. Uh, people are dying for that. Because the bacteria because is the resistant bacteria. to the yes, medicine. Yes, of course. After a week at sea, we left the Mare Nigrum, having received a bleak lesson in just how badly humans have damaged the Black Sea. Faced with the piles of rubbish and the contamination, it would be easy to write off the Black Sea as beyond help. There's plastic bottle, plastic bottle. Indeed, if we'd made this film in the 1990s, we would have probably stopped here. But thanks to a concerted international effort, this isn't the end. This is the River Danube. It's one of Europe's longest and most polluted rivers. It stretches its way almost 3,000 kilometers across southeastern Europe before emptying into the Black Sea. It's also a source of hope because over the last 20 years the Danube has been the subject of a massive cleanup operation and it appears to be working. So this is basically a river of human poo. Yeah. If you flush the toilet in Budapest in Hungary, there's a good chance it'll end up here. I wouldn't recommend swimming in here. Completed nine years ago, this is part of a water treatment revolution along the Danube, backed by billions of euros of European Union money. Before this plant was built, so around half of the uh, produced wastewater was going directly to the Danube. Raw sewage? Yeah, raw sewage. And after we have uh, built this one, uh, after 2010, now almost 95, 96% of the whole sewage is treated, biologically treated and going like this clean to the Danube. EU membership for countries like Hungary that the Danube flows through has meant cash for treatment plants and stricter rules on what industry and agriculture can put in the river. Those in charge of monitoring say it's made a real difference. EU provided a framework where the combination of the regulatory framework, the regulation, and the transfer of the money, the financial support to the new member state was one of the key factors of the improving of the situation in the Danube. So this is a positive story. You're sure that the Danube and by connection, the Black Sea are now on their way back. The worst is over. We can be happy and satisfied what we did with, in the terms of uh, reduction of the, of the pollution coming by the one big river, which is Danube, because we don't know much in, in, about the others, like Dnipro, Dniester. Definitely over the last 15 years, we witnessed improvement. The whole Danube Black Sea story is a success story of the countries transforming themselves in a better environmental management and in reaching a good, better environmental situation. In search of those signs of recovery, we headed off into the shallow part of the Black Sea, near to the mouth of the Danube. One of the best indicators as to whether things are getting better is the presence of this red seaweed called Philophora. Large Philophora fields were once common in this part of the Black Sea, but as the water quality deteriorated, the seaweed fields shrunk dramatically. In the past time, she was accumulated by tens of thousands of tons, and it was thought that she would always be. But when she didn't get into this process, 
море заболело, и э, филофора вот там пару десятков лет почти сошла на нет. Александр is heading 40 meters down to the bottom of the Black Sea to look for signs that the filofora is indeed on its way back. His underwater camera shows lots of jellyfish. They're an indicator of poor water quality and a sign there aren't many predators that might eat them. If there's lots of seaweed, then there's food and shelter for small marine creatures too. Back on the surface, Alexander gives his verdict. На глаз мне кажется, что море начинает потихоньку выздоравливать, и филофоры в сравнении с тем, что мы наблюдали два года назад, стало визуально больше. Но почивать на лаврах нам не приходится, потому что Вся, скажем, сейчас экосистема моря сильно нарушена. Oh, there they are. And what if the black sees larger mammals, like the dolphin? Two. How many do you think there are there? How many? Yeah. Uh, at least seven. Karina, a dolphin expert, is taking part in a major survey to try and find out if their numbers are recovering. So there's a group of dolphins that keep surfacing near where we are, and we are trying, oh, there they go, there they are again, to take good pictures of their fins, because dolphins have unique markings on their fins, and if we can get a good picture of the fin when it pops above the water, then it's possible to track and see if it's been seen somewhere else in the Black Sea. We have something like this. And you see uh, this uh, dorsal uh, back fin yeah, yeah. is uh, um, quite sharp. Yeah, it's got a little yeah, scar or something. A cut on it or yeah. something, yeah. So that, that should help you yeah. match to it to, to see if you've seen it anywhere before. Yeah. There are two species of dolphin in the Black Sea, but at the moment no one knows how badly they've been affected by all the pollution. Здесь какой-то, ну, просто колоссальный разброс в оценках, там, допустим, 10 тысяч, 500 тысяч, ну, совершенно непонятно, да, сколько. Это нам даст понимание, в каком состоянии находятся популяции, сколько дельфинов. Это позволит нам принимать какие-то меры для охраны. Though its overall condition remains grim, this is not a story without hope. The Black Sea does appear thanks in part to efforts along the Danube to have turned the corner. In very, very general term, uh, when I would be putting it in one sentence, is that actually Black Sea is recovering. For those who despair that humanity is incapable of rising to the scale of the global environmental crisis, the Black Sea is an example of how, with sustained effort, a seemingly endless tide of destruction can be slowed and just maybe turned. Hello, it may be a windy, showery and quite cold weekend to come, but at least there will be some sunshine occasionally. Here is the picture, low pressure dominating the scene, these disturbances moving on through with drier, brighter gaps and the isobars quite close together. It is going to be blustery out there. Too much wind really to allow too much in the way of frost to start the day on Saturday. Just a few pockets in Scotland, maybe one or two icy patches around as well. For many of us, there'll be some sunny spells from the word go. But showers are coming, this area moving north and east across England and Wales. Throughout the day, a feed of showers coming into Northern Ireland, wintry on hills, and into Scotland, particularly in the west, frequent showers here, heavy downpours at lower levels, some heavy snow to some of the hills here, so walkers take note of that. It is going to be a blustery day. These are some of the wind gusts, and the wind will get stronger again later in the day down towards the southwest of England, in particular, as another batch of wet weather starts to move in. 
And as for those temperatures, most of us in single figures, and many of us just into mid single figures. Now let's just run on through Saturday night and follow this area of wet weather feeding north across more of England and Wales. Could well be seeing some hill snow out of that through Wales, parts of northern England, even into the Midlands to relatively low hills at that. Northern Ireland and Scotland still seeing some snow falling in some of the hills here. Looks a bit colder across northern Britain to start off on Sunday morning. Icy in places and again don't be surprised if it's fairly wintry on fairly modest hills through parts of Wales, Northern England, perhaps the Midlands as we start off on Sunday morning. But then on Sunday there is a little bit of a gap between weather systems where more of us will be dry and get to see the sunshine before this comes in later in the day. Still a bit of uncertainty about timing. But yes, it does look quieter for a time on Sunday with some sunshine, perhaps a bit more widespread than it was during Saturday. Still a few of these showers delivering some snow to the hills of Scotland, mind you. And then, well, as we go on through the afternoon, it's across parts of southern England and Wales, we'll start to see this next system moving in with outbreaks of showery rain. I'm just putting the wind gust on again, maybe not as windy for some of us, but those winds really strengthening down towards South Wales and southwest England again late in the day. Eventually could see some gusts around 60 miles per hour. Similar temperatures, it is going to be chilly, but then again, occasionally we'll find ourselves in the sunshine. So to sum up the weekend then, there will be sunshine occasionally, it is going to be windy, it will be wet at times, and some of us will see some snow, maybe not just on the high hills. What happens if your mom rejects you? That's going to hit me hard. It's my родина, незаменимо. Had I harmed my family without really knowing it? That was my thoughts. محبي هي أساس كل شيء بالكون كله سوا. إتقاد عندن آدمي لك عندن واسكش تدا. What are little black girls going to think of you for protecting white supremacists? I don't think we're going to have the same life like Dad did drinking out of the river because it's all dirty now. Our World is a unique series of films on the BBC offering personal insights into global events. I believe in this place. I believe it can heal. I'm very happy. Our World. Stories that speak for themselves. This weekend on the BBC News Channel. Eight minutes ago, a sunbeam struck out into the vast vacuum of space. It did not bounce off course as so many others do. It was not absorbed. When it reached our atmosphere, it continued unfazed. This particular sunbeam came to you. And you were ready for it. To know what's coming, check the BBC Weather app. Some days of the week are just different. Get your fill of tech, travel, sport and documentaries. Weekends on the BBC News Channel. I've got a burning question. On a range of significant issues, a torrent of questions relating to... The Justice Committee. The European Union. The Intelligence Committee. The Irish backstop. So what is different about this? That's super complicated. <laughs> there you are. The special relationship between the UK and the USA. Beyond 100 Days, Monday to Thursday at 7 on the BBC News Channel.